Hello maths fans, Dr Tom Crawford here from Tom Rocks Maths and Numberphile. I'm also one of the tutors at St Edmund Hall here at the University of Oxford and today I'd like to talk to you all about differential equations. Now differential equations are covered in the further maths A level but don't worry if you haven't come across them yet as I'm going to be starting from the very beginning. One of the simplest examples that we first study are called second order linear differential equations and they have the following form. You have a constant a multiplying a second derivative of our unknown function y, so a d2y by dx squared plus a constant b times dy by dx plus a constant c times y and I'm going to set this equal to zero so we're going to consider the simplest case which we call the homogeneous case when this is equal to zero. This could also be a function of x and that would be the inhomogeneous second order linear differential equation. Now the way that we are taught to solve these equations kind of feels like magic because we're told to try a solution of the form y equals e to the mx, where m here is an unknown constant that we need to figure out. So what we do is we substitute this into our equation. So when I differentiate twice, I get an m squared factor coming down in front of the exponential and I'm left with the exponential. So sort of doing the derivatives and subbing in, I'm going to have an a, then I have an m squared, and then it's going to be e to the mx, where this term here is the second derivative, plus b, then I just get just a single m from just doing one derivative multiplied by e to the mx, then plus c times e to the mx, which is y, has to be zero. Now we know that the exponential function, whatever m is, will not be zero. Or we're not really interested in it as a way of thinking about it because what we're trying to figure out here is the value of m in our potential solution that we've been told sort of as if by magic to try as a possible solution. So what we can do is cancel the exponential and then what we're left with now is just a quadratic equation, am squared plus bm plus c equals zero. So this is just a quadratic equation for our unknown value of m, but a, b, and c are given by our initial second order linear differential equation. So we can just plug in a, b, and c from our equation, and then we can solve this using, for example, the quadratic formula. Now this is called the auxiliary equation, and some of you, if you've studied this, will be familiar with it. And as I say, we can solve this, and our solutions will just be m equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by to a. Now depending on the exact values we get for m, and here these could indeed be complex. So we could have real roots if the discriminant is positive. We can get purely imaginary roots, perhaps when b is zero, and we can also get complex roots when the discriminant here is negative. And depending on what values we get, we just take those numbers for m, those solutions for m, plug them into our sort of ansatz, as it's called, our suggested form of the solution here, and that tells us what the solution to the original differential equation must be. So for example, if m is two real roots, so suppose we have uh, m1 and m2, then our solution is a combination of those two roots. So it's y equals a e to the m1x 
plus b e to the m2 x. And then if we have complex roots, so let's suppose we have m equals alpha plus or minus i times beta, where i is the square root of minus 1, then our solution in this instance would be y equals e to the alpha x multiplied by a cos beta x plus b sine beta x. In these solutions over here, the constants a and b in our solutions, they are determined through the initial or boundary conditions. So we have a second order linear differential equation with these constant coefficients a, b, c. We try this solution. So this is our magic solution. We're just told, plug it in and see what happens. And it will always give us these solutions of this form, where it depends on m, which solves the auxiliary equation. So we will get either these trigonometric functions or exponentials, combinations of both. You can also rewrite the exponentials here as hyperbolic functions if you really want. So it covers a wide range of different functions, trying a solution like this. So the question now becomes, why did we try this solution in the first place? Like, where on earth does this come from? Because I'm just telling you, we try this solution, or your teacher perhaps tells you, we try a solution like this, we plug it in, solve the quadratic, we get our solutions. But if you think like a mathematician, and we will train you to think like this when you're doing your degree in Oxford and perhaps at other universities, you should be thinking to yourself, well, where does this come from? It's almost like it's been plucked out of thin air. Like, we've seen here that we can get exponential, trigonometric, maybe hyperbolic functions, but what if the solution is a polynomial? Or what if the solution is like a logarithm, for example? Like, this method doesn't allow for solutions of that form. So what if I'm missing some solutions by assuming that they all have this form in the first place? Fortunately, we need not worry. Because without realizing it, what we're actually appealing to here when creating this solution of this form, or when trying this in the first place, we're actually appealing to what we call the uniqueness of solutions. So a differential equation, a second order differential equation with constant coefficients, with two pieces of boundary or initial data. We can actually show that the whole problem has exactly one solution. So what that means is it doesn't really matter how we find the solution. So here, we're just making a very good guess. We're literally saying, well, most of these things look like this, Let's plug it in and let's see if we can find a solution. And then we go through all of these steps, we get our possible solution, then we fix the constants a and b. So what we end up with is a solution to the initial problem. But then you can just say, well, I know the solution is unique. So the fact that I have found a solution that works means I must have found the solution, because there's only one. So uniqueness is really, really powerful, because it doesn't matter how you get the solution. You can literally guess it. You can try anything, and if it works, then you can say, well, by uniqueness, there is only one solution. I have somehow stumbled across a solution that works, therefore, I have the only solution to this problem. And I don't need to worry about potentially missing other forms of solution, precisely because I can say there's a unique solution by this piece of maths, therefore I have found it. Now this piece of maths is called Picard's theorem, and the tricky part, as some of you may have guessed, 
is actually proving this theorem in the first place. So we cover this in the second year differential equations course here in Oxford. So Picard's theorem gives you a set of conditions, like a checklist, that you need to compare your problem against. It has to satisfy everything on this checklist, and as long as it does, then we can say, by Picard's theorem, the differential equation in question has a unique solution, and therefore I can just try this magic exponential form and if I get something that works, I must have found the one and only solution because we knew all along that it was unique by Picard's theorem. In fact, we can, and indeed do, go even further to investigate whether or not a particular problem is what we call well posed. So this crops up in a lot of the first year courses, but you'll see it again and again throughout the degree. And when we say a problem is well posed, we want to check if it satisfies three particular conditions. So the first one we're interested in is whether or not a solution exists. So a problem is well posed if you have existence. So if we are solving a particular problem, we want there to be a solution in order for it to make sense for us to study it and to try to solve it. So we want to try and show existence of a solution. We also then have uniqueness, which is what we've just been talking about with the differential equations and Picard's theorem. So if we're solving a particular problem, we want the solution to exist and we want it to be unique. And we've just seen how useful that can be when we're sort of guessing solutions. And finally, for a problem to be well posed, we want there to be what we call continuous dependence on the initial data. Now for this third one, I tend to think of this using a physical example. Because what this is really saying is if I slightly change the initial data or the starting setup of my problem, then I expect my solution to only change slightly as well. So if you think about conducting an experiment, and this can be any kind of experiment you may be done in science at school, for example, if you ever so slightly change the starting setup. So let's take the example of a simple pendulum. So a swinging pendulum. If I just increase the angle by one degree when I let go of the pendulum, it will still oscillate side to side. It might go a bit faster because it's a little bit higher up, but generally the solution changes a little bit. I slightly change where I started and I get slightly faster oscillations. It swings a bit more quickly. Now, not all problems actually demonstrate this third condition. There are also problems that won't demonstrate one and two as well, and we'll see some of those during the course. So the Navier-Stokes equations, for example, one of my favorite sets of equations as someone who works in fluid dynamics, we don't actually know if all three of these are true for the Navier-Stokes equations that model the flow of fluids. And that's in fact a million dollar question with one of the million dollar millennium problems from the Clay Institute. But back to this third condition. So I gave you the example of the simple pendulum and said we slightly change where we start, it might oscillate a bit faster. But if you have a double pendulum, then if you ever so slightly change your starting position, you actually get a very big change in the resulting motion. And that's actually one of the simplest examples of what we call chaos or chaotic motion. So if you ever so slightly change your starting conditions when you first let go of the pendulum, 
you get very, very different motion overall. Even though you changed it a tiny bit, your resulting trajectory can be incredibly different. So that would not satisfy this third condition. So the double pendulum is not a well-posed problem. Now we study chaos and chaotic systems in the third year course called Nonlinear Systems. And it's a really interesting course because chaos theory in general has only really been studied for the last 60 years or so. So what this means is that when you're studying this in your third year, you actually get to the point of almost being at the edge of our current knowledge. So you really get to the forefront of mathematical research and this whole idea of well-posed problems and chaos theory. So I hope that's given you an insight into some of the mathematical ideas that you could be studying here in Oxford. If you have any questions, please do get in touch. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at TomRocksMaths. There's also a contact form on my website, TomRocksMaths.com, and that comes directly to my university email. And if you fancy subscribing to my YouTube channel, TomRocksMaths, that would be awesome. I'll see you soon.